morning my name is mary onife debbie and welcome to business around town so excited to be here to talk to you today about business about money because i have something interesting that i want us to talk about today on the program and my guest is already here in the studio uh, yeah that makes me really happy that uh, he was able to make a time to come to the studio to talk to us today about this particular topic what are we talking about today what is the topic that has to do with business that has to do with money the topic today is fraud, dealing with fraud in your business, how to identify fraud, how to prevent fraud in your business. That's what we are talking about today, because according to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, ACFE, businesses lose around 5% of financial revenue due to fraudulent behavior. While that may sound like a relatively small amount, uh, it definitely adds up. That 5% can be more if you don't attend to it immediately. Serious fraud can occur in number of ways for a business, whether it's fraud within your business from the upper levels, fraud from an employee, or external fraud. It affects your company, and the effects can be very devastating. That is why we need to talk about fraud and how you can deal with it. We have a guest this morning that can do justice to this topic. He is John Poor Iwoha. He's a business strategy specialist, a visionary in chief, uh, a visionary in chief at Small Starters Africa. He has worked with dozens of entrepreneurs across the African continent to set up and to grow their businesses. John Poor is an alumnus of PwC is recognized by LinkedIn as a top voice on startup and entrepreneurship and has over 800,000 followers on the platform. His work, uh, works and uh, opinions have been featured in several local and international media, including CNN, TRW, and Business Day, and a whole lot. He's here this morning to talk to us. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasure yes. to be here. Yes, good to yeah. have you. Now, we are, we are looking at fraud mm -hmm. in businesses, be it a big business, be it a small business, the issue of fraud, mm -hmm. it can cripple a lot of businesses. True. Now, to get into the discussion, we'd like to know what is fraud? Simple terms, fraud is deceit that causes a person to lose something valuable. That thing could be money, could be products, it could be assets, whatever it is. And by deceit, you know, when I say deceit, that's like the broader definition of fraud. Because for the lay person, for the person who runs the average small business, yeah. fraud to them means that my staff is stealing my money or I'm losing my product. So theft is part of fraud, but fraud is much bigger than, than theft. Because if you're talking about deceit, when you get into the realm of uh, companies that are bigger, yeah. maybe public companies that need to publish financial statements, at that level, they can distort their numbers, they can misrepresent information to deceive the public, to deceive the regulators or the tax authorities or investors particularly. You could have it within companies where people are manipulating their sales targets because their commissions and their bonuses depend on those numbers. So they may distort. So they are not actually stealing any physical money, but they are deceiving the organization to the end, which is to gain uh, something personally, a financial incentive or something valuable. So. In a nutshell, that's what fraud is. To make the company look good. Yeah, to make the company look good. But like I said, small businesses may not be able to relate to this because it's just a CEO or a founder, and he's the person who benefits ultimately from the company. So as far as he's concerned, he's, not, he's looking at his margins, and the profit he's expecting is not, doesn't uh, reflect in what is in his bank account or her bank account, that sort of thing. So... I, I want to touch on something you said um, in the intro, yeah. which is that companies tend to lose on every 5%. Yes, according to this yeah, report. According to that study, yes. I can guarantee you that in these climbs, in the African region, it is much worse. I can also tell you that 5% to some people, which may look small, is a lot of money when you're talking about profits. Mm -hmm. you, if, you're, if you're looking at a company that's selling... Uh, consumer goods, mm -hmm. whether you're selling uh, milk or toothpaste or something, the margins on those things are terribly low, sometimes 3 to 5%. So if you're losing 5% of your revenues to theft, that's like you're working for nothing. At the end of the day, you just see customers pay you everything, but there's nothing for you to take home. 
So yeah. that's why it's dangerous. Is it possible for a business to run without uh, fraud? Because I've heard uh, business owners say mm -hmm. um, it, they, they do it, but you just have to make enough profit to get by that your eyes can be everywhere. Okay. But is it possible to run a business free of fraud, free, free of stealing? From, I'm talking about uh, for small business owners, not for big okay. organizations. Now. Okay, so life is always relative, yes. right? But even in, um, in accounting parlance, there's something that's called materiality. So what materiality means is that this thing I'm looking at, is it sufficient enough to cause us damage and affect the viability of the business for us to not survive? So as we go further into this conversation, you understand how you can press down fraud to very minimal levels but totally eliminating it, we cannot even really tell. Because the interesting thing about fraud is we're dealing with human beings. Yeah. And as you're going to find out in this conversation, one of the most cleverest creatures on earth is a human being. They, they have this, they make their plans, it's in their head, you cannot read their mind, you cannot predict their next move, they can change on you, they have that funny thing called emotions. So it's a very, it's a, a, a police and thief kind of situation yes. but can you put down fraud to the barest minimum yes of course it's very possible and i'm going to be discussing how now nah, let, let's get into it how do we because the time is running okay and we have so much to talk about okay. so how do we prevent a fraud first of all let's talk to medium and small scale business owners first let's address that audience okay before we move to big companies and organizations okay so the very first place to start because um and what i'm going to start here is that we're talking to an audience that has a wide range of businesses, from service businesses to product businesses and all types. Yes. So I always like to start from the why, because entrepreneurs are smart enough that if they understand why something happens, they can get creative and innovative around um, solving the problem and even go above and beyond the tips I'm going to share today. Yes. So the question is, why does fraud happen? Now, there are three main reasons why fraud happens, and it's called the fraud triangle. And if you can plug these things in your business, you can significantly reduce fraud. The first point of that triangle is opportunity. If there is opportunity to steal money, if there is opportunity to uh, take something from the business without repercussion, it's very likely a human being working in your business is going to take that opportunity. The second point of the triangle is the incentive. There has to be an incentive for that person to want to commit that fraud. Yes. Yeah. That which essentially is the motivation or the pressure to commit the fraud. And the third interesting point is justification. Because believe you me, I've been in situations where uh, an employee was caught stealing money. And then when the person was taken to maybe police or whatever, you will be shocked at the kind of rationalizations these people have. In fact, some of them would go as far as saying that they do not feel that what they have done is wrong that it is within their rights to do what they have just done. And from the explanations I'm going to be giving in this session, you understand why people come to such realizations. And why the rationalization part is important is because this is what makes the thief a motivated thief. Because to some of them, they don't feel they are doing anything wrong. They saw money, they took it. Why did you take this money? Is it your own? And you start to hear some very interesting things. In fact, it might even help to start from the rationalization part. Yeah. One common reason why some people will say they are taking it is because the leaders are doing it. Oga de Duam, Madame de Duam. So Madame inflates uh, contracts. Madame steals from her customers. Madame cheats her suppliers. Madame cheats distributors. So it only makes sense that somebody has to cheat Madame. So, and it makes, so if you listen to them, and sometimes it can become a very awkward conversation because yeah. the so-called Madame Olga is there. And they don't know that those things they think they are doing in secret or they are doing in private, that these employees are seeing what is going on. And then they're like, if you can take your own pound of flesh from an unsuspecting person, why shouldn't I, why shouldn't I, why shouldn't I do mine? That's uh, rationalization. Another rationalization is some employees feel they've been treated poorly. For ex one common example is they are paying me below what they should be paying me. Yes, that, that is very common. That's a very common. So they come and say, you know, this, this company is cheating me for all the work that I do, for all the good things that I do for this company. This is how much they pay me. This is how much my peers are getting. I know this company can pay me what I am worth. I know because I see the money. I work in finance. I work in purchasing. Yes. And they are not paying me. So if I'm taking this extra, I'm just getting the balance of what I'm due. And when you listen to these kinds of things, you're like, you know, somehow maybe it makes sense. But the truth is, it is fraud. And that's why, rational, that's why the rationalization part 
of the fraud triangle is very important because it speaks to things that, you know, when uh, a business owner wants to plug fraud, they go the hard way, the police way. Do this, don't do this. Lock up here, put this place under lock and key, uh, limit uh, approval limits, uh, reduce access. Let the money go through a channel. Exactly. One person, you know, takes charge. CCTV everywhere. Exactly. Very important point, CCTV everywhere. Those are the hard aspects. But remember what I said in the beginning. Human beings are very crafty, creative, and sneaky. You can put in all the CCTV, everything. They will make you doubt what you're looking at in that video evidence. So that's why leaning on the hard controls is not enough. You have to, you have to work on the hearts. So it's a matter of hearts and minds. You have to work on because if somebody believes that he's been cheated or she's been cheated, I don't think there's any CCTV. It's just a matter of time. Maybe just that one day that the CCTV has a problem or the gen goes down. That might be the day they hit because they are motivated. They believe that truly they are supposed to do this. But I want to backtrack a bit to yeah. why this, um, this conversation is very important. Yeah. Many small and mid-sized businesses today are living significantly below their potential. They, are, they want to grow, but they are afraid of growing. And let me explain why. Yeah. You have a company that is making money serving customers. They are doing well in Lagos. They know that they, they can also do well in Abuja and Port Harcourt. They can expand. But the owner of the business is, they want it, but they cannot do it. And what I mean is this. This is the reason why we have a preponderance of one man and one woman businesses. Because they want to be generals in the business. They want to make sure they see everything coming in and everything going out. And that's the reason why they don't want to expand to Abuja. Because if they're in Abuja, they have to depend... And some on... people, they've tried it before. I, yes. know, I know of a company, it's actually a water company, bottle water and bread. Yeah. They're doing well in Lagos. Mm -hmm. So they went to Delta State. Yeah. They brought a, employed a manager and set up everything, bought all the equipment. Mm. The business did not survive too years because mm. they had a lot of people stealing, stealing people going home with the bread and the water just one just two and that's how the business crumbled, crumbled. but he had a manager he had people set in place and everything so i think it's one of the reasons why most times they don't expand. they don't expand but but then that's coming at a cost because this is a business that has the potential to grow but you cannot grow because you are afraid of losing control. And one of the biggest reasons why people are afraid of losing control is if you're a fraud. Yes. Yeah, if it goes out of my out of my purview, I will not see what is going because on. Because there, 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 there are some, mm. some business I've seen. The mm. madam is even in front. Exactly. Where I went to a big restaurant where I went to buy local food. She, yes. She's the one. Every money goes through her. You see. You see. Every <laughs> money goes through now, her. I, I can guarantee you that that is not one of the... That's not the joy of being an entrepreneur. One of the reasons why, at least for most of the people I know, clients, uh, you know, students and all that, one of the biggest motivations for people who own businesses is freedom and flexibility. I want to take time off, attend to family, you know, I, I, I want to afford to be sick. I want to, not, I want to afford to not be able to answer to somebody. So when you take away freedom and flexibility from an entrepreneur, they feel caged because they can't see the difference between what they are doing and having like a well, job where they someone, are, yeah. exactly, that, 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 that sort of thing. So that's why this topic is very important because if you can understand fraud and know how to counter, counteractive, all of a sudden, it's as if the floodgates of your business are let open and then you can grow and expand because you know what you're looking at so if, if you allow me to go back to the triangle yes yeah i was yeah, i was talking about the yeah triangle. and so, i have a question from the triangle but okay we'll, but finish the triangle talk before we go to the question okay yes. okay good so I, I i just i talked about the rationalization part the reasons people give for yes. for stealing the first one i talked about was the opportunity when there are gaps in the business it's only a matter of time before somebody takes something, which, of course, leans on that adage that opportunity makes a thief. Because most people will tell you they don't steal. But then if you create the opportunity, I can tell you that some people will be like, you know, if I do this, nobody will see me. So let me do it. So that opportunity is one of the reasons why people will steal. And interestingly, the opportunity is the only part of the triangle that a company can truly control. You can control opportunity. You cannot control the justification or rationalization of any human being. People would come up with any excuse they want to steal. Yes. You cannot come up with incentives. People steal for various reasons. They might want to, they might steal your product because they want to personally use it. Or they might steal cash. Right? So opportunity is very important. And you know, to delve deep, to delve a bit um, uh, deep into the opportunity side, 
one common way that businesses make a mistake with opportunity is that they don't separate duties. So the person who collects the money is the person who holds the money, is the person who deposits the money in the bank, and is the person that does bank reconciliations. One person does all these things. So when you have a chain from the beginning to the end, what it means is that you don't need to collude with anybody. You can, one common example, you can collect money from a customer and not write a receipt. And then it looks as if that transaction never really happened. Yes. You can collect money from a customer and write a lower amount on the receipt and then take the difference. You know, so being able to separate duties where you, you, you include more than one person in a chain of activities. The person who holds the check and writes the check is not the person who signs the check. The person who raises the transactions is not the person who approves. So by making two people at least be able to collude before they can do something wrong, that opens an opportunity for something for you to find out something. Another one is poor supervision. There are areas in a business that require close supervision. Mm -hmm. And this is where I want people to pay close attention. The moment you walk into a banking hall for a commercial bank, you will notice the tellers are sitting in front. But then you will notice a gentleman or a lady just on one desk sitting at the back. That, yes, per that yes. person is yeah, the supervisor. Right. That is yes. the person who you bring up a check of a certain amount or something, they will take you to the back. And then the person will do something on the computer and then approve and then go. So what it means is that the teller alone cannot do certain things without the collusion of the supervisor. But again, the supervisor is a much more experienced person, better tested, has more to lose, has a better reputation, you know, has yes. a more reputation to lose. So you make it more difficult for... A, a person on a lower kid, a teller, to collude with their supervisor to steal something. It can happen. But then remember, I said life is about relativity. Yeah. It is easier for a teller alone to steal money. But then to collude with a supervisor, it might be, it might be difficult. Okay. Another reason why there's opportunity is there's no documentation. A lot of businesses are running out of the operating system, sitting inside the head of the CEO or the founder. You ask him for this transaction, he'll tell you, okay, it happened on Tuesday last week. They, they don't have a trail and it doesn't just have to be a paper trail even if it's these days everything is digital even for a small business even for a small business yeah these days you have apps on your phone that you can use to record transactions on your business uh, you know your business you even have uh, these things that can read uh, qr codes and things like that mm -hmm. even the banks are beginning to introduce products and services that allow businesses to be better organized because the thing is the moment something is documented you have a reference and the moment there is a reference, it's only a matter of time before you can find out where something has gone wrong. So these are usually the areas that create opportunity for people to steal in, in business. And um, the other one I talked about is the incentive. Why would somebody want to steal? And mm -hmm. there are a myriad of reasons. In the current economy, as things are going bad, uh, business owners need to watch out because the, the, the threats and the vulnerabilities are increasing. People are under growing financial and economic pressure. So people, people have bills to pay. Another unfortunate thing, which I think is gradually becoming a social problem, is the growing uh, presence of uh, betting opportunities. So there are people who are indebted. There are people who are either owing loans or they've taken a stick somewhere and then they lost a bet or something like that. So these are the three main reasons why anybody would want to steal from you. If there is an opportunity, people will take it. If people have an incentive to steal, like they want money or they want to steal your product or they want to steal that new computer you bought, they are going to take it. And the third one is they need a strong reason. So if you can start knocking out one or more of these things, you can reduce the likelihood for fraud in, in the business. Like you said, you said uh, it's the opportunity to steal. Yes. Now, because you cannot go, you don't know the reason why the person is stealing, you can't go to the person's psychology, why the person is stealing. But I think from the process of hiring, yeah. when you want to hire someone, mm -hmm. from there you can judge the person's morale to know that would this person steal? So is, it, it, is it possible it, from the hiring process? In fact, you, you, you're, you're spot on because... One of the um, ways to mitigate this, one of the ways to mitigate fraud mm -hmm. is strong controls. It's called internal controls. Mm -hmm. Now, what in internal controls mean is that you have processes in your business that prevent or protect the business from certain risks. Now, because the single point of failure for fraud is likely the human being, yes. computers don't lie, they are fairly much more consistent than human beings are, the processes around how you bring in 
human beings into your business, how you bring in employees into your business, how you onboard them, how you manage them while they are in your business, and how you manage their exits. Because there have been cases in, you know, particularly banks, yes. where an employee is leaving, and they are leaving with something that many business owners will not consider very, very valuable, which is customer information. So they are not stealing your money, they are not stealing your assets, but they are going with your database of customers. They have the customer names, they have their phone number, they have their emails, they know how much money they have spent. People don't realize how much value is sitting in a customer list because mm -hmm. I can sell it to your competitor, I can start reaching out to them to badmouth you as a company mm -hmm. if you didn't treat me well. There are so many things I can do to damage your business just with a customer list. So, but then when somebody says, I quit, Many people just think, oh, there goes another one. I don't need to pay this one's salary. But then, how do you make sure that they are liable for anything that happens after they leave your, your business? Some businesses even say, uh, because of uh, intellectual property or what you were doing for this company, there is a non-compete clause. What it means is you cannot talk to any other company or any business or any person who is doing something similar to this company, and you cannot work for them for the next two years after you leave this company. And what does it take? It's just a clause in a contract. And when people know that they are liable, they cannot, you know, exploit. So those processes, those internal control processes, and if you allow me, let's go with the employee hiring people, which yes. is where this conversation came from. Yeah. One important opportunity that business owners don't use is references. Now, yes, as part of a yeah, standard you CV, you ask for references, but people normally don't, don't actually... Call, out, call, call the references to actually verify information. No. Yeah. And yeah. there are a couple of reasons why. People will be like, it's the employee who provided this reference. So it's very likely the person I call will say something good about, about the person. person yeah. yeah, that sort of thing. And most times, we are wowed by the interview itself. That this person is so good, there's no point to verify. you know verify the references. But again, always remember the core of it. You're dealing with human beings. Um, we are very good at smoke and mirrors. We're very good at appearances, you know, stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so without even reaching out to the previous, uh, to the place the person worked, forget about the references and start understanding the employment history. When did you finish school? Okay, where did you serve? After that, what did you do? You know, you're asking some side tracking questions and they may, you're trying to understand the employment history so that when it's time to come back to the references, you've already locked in the person. The person cannot say, I didn't work here, I didn't work here. So, okay, so after that, where did you work? And then what did you work? Okay, say, so, okay, yeah, okay. So what did you do at the last place? Uh, why did you leave? And then, of course, they'll give you a reason. Maybe they were not paying me enough or, you know, something. They were not training me. We're like, okay, that's fine. So who were you reporting to in that company? He says, okay, this was my manager, but then the owner of the company is this one. So, okay. Okay, so Fred was your manager. He was a person, so he's a person who knows most of the work you did and everything, right? Okay. Do you still talk to Fred? Said no, blah. Is he on LinkedIn? Okay, fine. So now pay attention to this question. It's not if. When I call Fred, what do you think he's going to say about you? Like I, I plan to call him right now. You say you guys are still in touch. Well, if I call Fred, or when I call Fred now, what will he say about you? One, what will he say are your strengths? And what will Fred say are your weaknesses? Because nobody is perfect. So what's one or two areas will you say Fred? Will you say Fred will say, ah, Bimbo is not really good in these two areas. Now, what you're going to do is you put that person on their toes and they start coming up with very important self-critical information. They start telling you, Fred is going to say, you know, but there was this project we did. I know I was right, but he was just acting up. He was, you start getting some very important information. About it, that person. Yes. If the person locks up about a particular name, or company or something, that is one area you need to look at. And it's not as if you need to do this for all your employees, but the more mission critical their work is, like if they are going to be manning money, they will be responsible for procurement or dealing with your suppliers, anything that concerns money coming into the business or going out. You need to pay closer attention to their employment history and their, and their references. Great. So, the, the time is one minute past ten. Okay. And, uh, yes, uh, yeah. we will have about uh, 24 minutes more, so we still have time. Okay. So if you have a question for our guest this morning, mm. you can send us a WhatsApp message on 0700-903-9039. 0700-903-9039. Or you can send us a text message on 0700-903-9039. 
0302-903-903. Please don't call. You, you can only call if the question is so important and you have to say it mm -hmm. uh, so, so we can uh, continue our conversation without any uh, obstruction. Now, I once had a boss mm -hmm. and um, he, he, he called me one day lamenting seriously that do I know that Biodun, which is the accountant, yeah. she stole about um, 300 million? Hmm. I was shocked because if you see this lady, she doesn't wear earrings. No. She, she, she's the definition of being prima and proper. So one would never tell that she could do that. And that is why the boss hired her. No, the records are clean. She's a church woman, married, has a family, a humble family, and she's been diligent in that office. Every the, the and you know what happens? The boss takes home the checks. Okay. So the woman does not have any, any access to the check. So if anything wants to happen, you go to the boss. He will sign the check and give to her to take to the bank. But this woman was so smart that she went to the bank to tell them that the boss misplaced a particular check and they should give her. Hmm. And she did it so well. And they called the boss said yes, give her what she wants because she's been doing the job for. For long. So she gathered all the checks, checkbook from different banks. So she has them. She knows how to sign the man's signature. Hmm. So when they, they were building a house, when the husband needs money, that is the Bioduna, she'll take the boss check, just sign one million, go there, collect. Wow. And, <laughs> and the boss was doing very well. So it was on a particular day mm -hmm. that she went to the bank to collect the money. And uh, one officer, somebody working in the bank, just said, they should notify a new intake, should notify the CEO of an amount that is about to leave mm. the bank. So she, he, the guy called the boss. So the boss was surprised and said, okay, okay, keep her there. Just keep her busy. Let me come because I did not authorize this. But before then, she has stolen so much. Mm. So in terms of this referral that you talked about, that you, you do employ, like you said, human beings are very... Yeah. So, very clever so she went away with that money they caught her but they stole some of the asset but but this is a woman that is no earrings you know what i mean that's yeah. almost almost pious. so this presents an interesting case study for this conversation because mm -hmm. i'm already seeing where the gaps are but at the top of it the 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 founder's major mistake was that he didn't respect a very basic principle which was in dealing with fraud and all this thing which is trust but verify if your people feel like you don't trust them, it will still affect the rationalization thing. Like, after all, I put on my work for this man, everything, he still doesn't trust me, let me just steal. So trust is important, but verification is also important. So you trust, but you verify. What do I mean? I still trust Biodun, I allow her to do all those things. But verification comes in very simple ways. One is okay. a yeah. bank... Hold, a, hold okay. the thought, yeah. we, we have a caller. Mm. Maybe there's a serious question that we need okay. to get. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning to you. Okay, we've lost the call. No calls, please. Let's just do a WhatsApp <laughs> message so we can flow. Okay, yeah. So a bank reconciliation, which is one control measure you can do, depending on the volume of transactions, you can do weekly or monthly. If there was a bank reconciliation done, what a bank reconciliation will show is, this is how much money we have as a bank balance. These are all the deposits. These are all the withdrawals. You compare it with your ledgers. How much money you have, and that would have instantly thrown up a couple of things. The, the boss could not do it because yeah. he thought he had everything locked down. Uh -huh. he's, he's a busy man. So he was so too, he he was too trusting. The, yes, with the checks, he goes mm -hmm. around with everything from yeah. five five hundred now. Whatever you want to take from the company goes through him. Yeah. So he couldn't waste his time to check those. And the second thing was that if you notice, Biodun is a it was a, a single point of failure. He did not segregate duties. Remember that thing I said about one person handling transactions, dealing with the bank, everything. So it is easier for fraud to happen when there's a straight line and one person controls that entire line. So that was another thing that happened. Another one would have been for a company that size, when 300 million naira is at stake, I would have easily assumed that you can get an accountant who comes in once yearly or two times in a year. And what they do is very simple. They run a couple of tests just to know whether they should start sniffing in a particular direction. And they would have seen something like this. So this was a clear case of complacency, trusting more than verifying, and allowing one person monopolize an entire trail of, of transactions. Mm, so so it's still the human element. Mm, let's, take, mm. let's take a WhatsApp message now. Okay. We, we, we have one here. So it says, good morning to you. Great program you have. I'm experiencing such right now. I own a supermarket. 
by the way, my name is Femi. Uh, I'm, the name is Femi from Ikpaja. Okay. He said, I, I run a supermarket and uh, I'm experiencing such <clears throat> right now. The, I have a, a sales girl that has been working with me for almost two years. But I discovered that my account books don't add up. I've been losing money. But she's been mounting that uh, dex since. I discovered that she is stealing, but I don't have proof for it. I name my products, name my product. Maybe he meant mm -hmm. put the prices in the product. Yes. And she sells and keeps the money. Mm -hmm. And then later on when she comes, we try to close the books. How, 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 how can I do this? What better ways can I make sure that nobody steals from me? Okay, so um, interestingly, it's a supermarket owner who, who called. And people in retail suffer a disproportionate amount of loss when it comes to thefts. And that's because of the nature of the business. Your customers come in, they have access to your product. There's a lot of cash, you know, yes. exchange going on, yes. right? So it's very clear that it's likely the problem is at the cash collection point. And a couple of ways. You know, you so yeah. this person at the cash point has a colluder, a friend from the outside who comes in, picks up a product, and then goes to the till, but it's not recorded. And then the person walks out. So oh. that is harder because there is no evidence that the transaction took place. So you end up not getting the cash and not seeing the transaction. That one is harder to spot. But of course, there's a way around it. The second one is that somebody comes in, a normal customer comes in, pays for a product. Yeah. She takes that money, puts it in her pocket, and does not register the transaction. Right? The third level is that the customer comes, she, the, the person at the cash point collects the money, records the transaction, but keeps the money. Now, for, for you to catch any of these things going in will be a combination of supervision plus trying to balance the accounts that are going on. And I think what is missing in his equation is that he doesn't understand, he doesn't know what his standing inventory is. Because if I have stock and my stock is 10 pieces and I come back and it's eight pieces, is either you show me the two products, whether broken or spoilt, or you show me the money. It's either of these two things. But if I don't know the volume of my stock or the number of my stock, I will only be focusing on the cash. I just say money is missing, but I cannot prove it because I, I don't know. What is happening to this? Uh -huh, it's likely. So he knows money is missing. He knows money is missing, but he cannot prove it. So it's, he needs to bring in the inventory parts in, into this conversation. And the second part, which, uh, which is good that he mentioned, is that one way to find out if something is going on, and you know, there's a lot we can learn from big companies because they've already set up most of these structures. Mm -hmm. In big companies, you must go and leave. When it's time for you to go and leave, some companies now say, you know, you cannot, if you move your leave to the next year, you lose it. The reason they are saying it is, when you go and leave, we're going to notice if something has changed. We might notice that we're making more money. This point, <laughs> this point you, you just raised now yeah. is, is so, so important that many small businesses, they miss. Exactly. They, will tell you, no they want to squeeze their employees yeah. for a hair. They'll be like, why will you go and leave and I'll still pay you? No, it's a control measure. Uh -huh. Even if it's two weeks, allow them to go and leave and replace them with somebody else. Apart from the fraud going on, you might notice that the new person is more effective on the job or is better at customer service, or people prefer her, or something. You move people around and rotate them. Another thing it does is it, it unsettles people. Because for you to steal, you need to be comfortable in your position, which is like a building. You need to know that a guy will come in at 9.30, and he must leave by 7. I know this because he, have, he has been doing it for the past seven years. No, you don't want somebody to, you rotate people around, and then that's where you know if, if, if something is going on. But I, I think there's a risk that I might miss out on an important aspect I think company, um, business owners need to realize. Yeah. You know, initially I talked about hiring. Yes. The biggest part of um, handling fraud, which takes care of the two other triangles that I said are outside of the control of a business owner, which is rationalization and the incentives, yes. is the culture of the company. A, the culture of a company is the operating system, the invisible hand that runs that company. I'll give you an example. You go to some companies, when the owner of the business is around, everything is running smoothly. Everybody is efficient. Yes. The moment the owner of the business is not around, you come in there, somebody is somewhere lounging, the other one is there playing loud music, a customer comes in, they ignore them, and you start asking, is it not the same employees that know how to perform their jobs when a guy is around? And then when a guy is not around, all of a sudden, 
they are not performing. That's a, there's a, there's a culture deficit happening there, which is that people in that environment just see that they are working for this man, they are working for this woman. I don't have any stake here. And I only get paid for what, I, what he can see that I'm doing. So there's a lot of eye service, you know, stuff like that. But if the culture of the organization is one of ownership, where people see that working for the business somehow is like working for themselves, right? Where it is cool to do your work. And it's not just cool to be the favored one or stuff like that. And sometimes the owner of the business helps these kinds of things. When you play favorites, when you don't run your business based on merit, somebody, say, somebody stays and he's been working for the business for two years or something, and then another person comes in. It's not as if you are better than me or whatever, and then you are any better than me because you are from the same place as Oga, or you are related to Oga or something. All those things breed bad blood. And all of a sudden, your people start to disengage mentally from your business. Mm -hmm. When you are not around, they don't care about you. They just show up for work because they are working for you just because of salary. And you don't want employees who work for you just because of salary. Because you will be making them mercenaries. A mercenary is a person who works for a company only because of money. And the moment you can offer a better amount, they will leave you. But try and recruit somebody from a company that has a strong culture. The moment they, are, they, they, they even think about leaving that company, they are thinking of all the opportunities for exposure, training, the personal bonds they have built with their friends there. What would their wife say? Are you saying that my wife will no longer be able to talk to Mary whenever we are doing end of year? But, so, but how many companies do we have that can be such... It doesn't cost money. It's not about money. That's the funny thing. So you're saying that even small businesses, yes. businesses can build this kind of culture. This exactly. Kind of we, have, we have people who think in terms of uh, transactions. I'm a boss. You work for me. So, so how, do, how people, do you do this stuff? How do you do it? You need, you need to... What you are looking for instead is a team. You need to build a team. And for, for you to build a team, you need to find out what motivates the people who are working for you besides money. Now, there are some people who come to a company and they want experience. They want to gain experience. They want training. They want to get better at their job. They want to build a skill. Some want leadership opportunities. They want to lead other people, achieve something. Sometimes it's not even about these things I'm talking about. It's about a compelling vision, that the company has a vision of something that they are doing. Maybe they are working on an interesting problem. And they see how you are very passionate about this thing, how you treat your customers, how you treat people. So they buy into the company, not because of how much money you are paying them, but because their identity is tied to that company. So not to disparage any industry, for example. I've tried before to hire somebody yeah. who works in a bank to go and work for a startup. And even though the startup will pay the guy more, he refused. He said it doesn't make any sense. He says it's a... So based on the response, you will not see what matters to him. He says nobody knows that company. What it means is that when he goes for a party over the weekend and they ask him that common question, where do you work? I cannot say this bank or that bank where everybody already knows that bank. I have to mention this name and start explaining to them what I do. You know, so for them, the identity, the, the, the value is about the prestige. I work for a bank. I go to work every morning. I put on my suit, my tie. And I, look, I look important. So it's not just about the money. Some people just want to look important. For some, it's, I have a company car. I have a driver who but, takes me around. But I have a question. As a business owner, mm -hmm. now you are talking about having a personal relationship with each employee no because, it's not it's not because, personal no, really no, but how do you now i'm an employer mm -hmm. i have let's say 20 staff mm -hmm. how do i i know that mary wants to be recognized mm -hmm. john likes money mm -hmm. yetunde likes uh, the paparazzi mm -hmm. so it means i have to interfere with talk with them so much that i understand how they think mm -hmm. and know what will appeal to them or is there a way i can just generalize no. this to save time the, the reason why people get lost in the weeds about that is that they really don't even know what the company itself wants to achieve. If you know what the company wants to achieve in the next three years, five years, this is what we want to do. From the people you are hiring, for example, one thing I do with clients is I don't do job descriptions because a job description says this is what you are going to do. You don't want people who do things. You want people who can achieve things. So in the next three years, these are the things we want to achieve. And our payments and everything, how you progress in the company promotion, will be based on your ability to achieve those things. Now, when people are in the company, it's very clear. If I'm not meeting my targets, 
I cannot blame any other person. It's because I, I don't measure up to Mary, who is doing a better job. So if I say Mary should become the team lead, it's not because it's close to Oga. It's because Mary is better at the job. And then if I don't like it, I leave. But guess what I'm leaving? I'm leaving, I'm leaving a merit-driven system. Not because anybody was bad to me, but because I couldn't compete. So you make the company about competition. And you make it clear to everybody that these are the rules. This is how we behave here. These are the things that we, these are the things that we, so if you look at some companies, they'll tell you things like, we value excellence, we value leadership, we value integrity. I would be surprised for any bank not to have integrity as one of their values or something close to that. Mm. The reason they are doing all those things is that these are the kinds of people that work here. And these are the kinds of people who we promote here and who succeed here. If you don't have these values, you are going out. And you have to make it very clear from the very top to the bottom. If you say, here, we show up on time, our client meetings and all of that, and you as a leader cannot show up on time, you better remove it from your value statement. Because your people are going to hold you to account. And the moment you're not living up to those values, they mentally disengage. And the moment the culture falls apart, you start to notice all these problems. They start to steal from you. You start to see eye service. They start to sabotage the business and, and all sorts of things. So it all rises and falls <coughs> on leadership. Leadership and culture. The leader sets the tone for the culture. And by being consistent on what he says or what she says, the culture then builds. And see the beautiful thing that happens. Once culture sets in and you have your missionaries, the people who are... you. So, for example, I'm, I'm an, an alumnus of uh, PwC. And there you hear things that... There is a, you say there's a PwC person. What does it look like? All of us were not born in the same way. They say there's a way they behave and they think. So at the end of the day, you retain people who who fit that your culture. And then when new people come in, guess what? You don't need to know the rest. Those missionaries will not assimilate the newcomers. They are not the ones who that we don't do this here. Oh, oh we don't allow this here. So listen to what I'm saying. I'm not saying Oga does not allow this. I'm saying we we. You know, they are not shareholders in the company. They don't yeah, own the company, yeah. but now they own it because it's a culture. They say, ah, no, don't do this again. We don't do this here. This is, un you hear the this is unacceptable here. The culture has, has taken place. So people don't take time to build culture. They, they just want transactions. Can you do the job I hire you? I'll pay you 550000 When you have mercenaries working for you, it's only a matter of time. Once the opportunity shows up, they are sufficiently motivated, and you give them a reason to rationalize, fraud will happen. You can put in all the CCTV cameras, all the uniform security people, human beings will always outclass you. You know, this point you just made now, you should be paid millions for this. <laughs> 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 but, 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 the, but, but the truth is, mm. many business owners, mm. the truth here mm. in Nigeria, mm. many small business or big business owners don't care yes. about the employee. Yes. The truth. And they know. They know. They can see it. They mm. can feel it. They don't care. All they care is the money yeah. the, employees, the employees bringing in. All mm. they hear is the money. Yeah. So when they get an opportunity to make more money, they, they go. True. So building that culture is even more important. Far more important. It means you have to be ready to work with the, the, the weak points of that employee. Yes. You have to be there when the employee is down. You have to tell that employee. You have employee, to invest in them, in yes, their future. You have yes. To invest. That yes. I, I really you do care about it. Exactly. You. you don't invest, then you don't get anything. That's, that's the problem. And, you know, these days, you're talking to people. And the, the unfortunate thing is, if you want to build a lasting organization, is the culture that builds it. Because see what a fantastic culture does. The moment you have somebody, you, the moment you have culture fit, you can send anybody to anywhere and you can be sure that nothing will go wrong. That's why a company from Europe will send one man to come and open their Nigeria office. And that one man will open the office, hire people, manage everything, yes. and the other of the we company is happen. sleeping in Europe. Yes, we see it happen. It's because of the culture, not because there's any CCTV camera. So here, we like the military approach. You put in a lot of CCTV cameras. And I keep, you are dealing with human beings. No camera on earth is enough to cover all the angles. The only thing I've seen that can cover all the angles is culture. And the reason culture is powerful is that culture is a CCTV camera on the heart. It is self-monitoring. <laughs> yes, you cannot. Yeah, so that, that's, that's the thing about Culture it. Culture is a CCTV camera on, 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 on the, the heart. heart. Yes, on the yes, heart. exactly. So if you, if you want to prevent fraud, mm. as in to the barest minimum. Exactly. And you're asking me for what is one solution to it? I'll tell you culture. You ask me for the second one, I'll tell you leadership. You ask me for the third one, I'll tell you internal controls. Your budgeting, 
your CCTV camera, your auditing, all the hard stuff you can do. Yes. It, it's been a, a great program. Thank uh, you. But let's take some, some <laughs> questions from uh, people that have been trying to reach us through a uh, WhatsApp message. Okay, this is Voice of the People 19.3 FM. In case you're just tuning in, you've missed quite a number of things. You've missed a lot, but uh, we'll put this up on YouTube so you can go watch it. The topic <coughs> is how to prevent fraud in your business because it's very, very rampant. A lot of businesses are dying today because people are stealing from them, being big or small businesses. Okay, this one says, good morning, ma. Uh, this is the program that I'm really enjoying. The business program thank you so much i like what your guest is saying i have learned a lot today from the program my name is choma and i'm listening from festac thank you uh for that respond you say oh good morning to you mary i love this program i have learned a lot i have a restaurant business and i never knew this issue about culture thank you so much for this program Okay, uh, let me read another one, another message here. Is it thank, thanks to VOP, I'm listening to the program now from Ikorodu area, talking about business. But the truth is that you can never take away fraud from some businesses. People that will steal will steal. May God help us. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Now, we have another interesting question. Say, good morning. My name is Olawale. And I'm listening to you right now from Ikeja area. Thank you for your program. I really appreciate it. And to your guest, Paul, thank you for the program. Now, talking about the issue of fraud, what do you do to uh, uh, an employee who you caught stealing? How do you deal with them? Should you drive them, arrest them, or talk to them, make them repent in terms of building a good culture, an example for the others? How do you deal with this, Olawali? Okay. okay. Yeah, this thing, this last one is a question. Okay, so um, uh, thank you for that question. Now, the interesting thing is the, 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 that you caught somebody who has stolen from you yes, is a nah. very unique and important moment. Okay. Because it's okay. a learning moment. Yes. One, the first thing it tells you is that there is a gap. There's an opportunity. And remember, opportunity is the one that the, that the business has full control over. So there was an opportunity. How, how was this possible? So there's a learning moment for you. There's also a learning moment for the organization. How did we get to the point where this person stole money and no other person knew about it? So what I would um, advise is some companies have this uh, rule about strikes. You might have like a two-strike rule or a three-strike rule. Yes. If you steal two times, you are out of here or we take whatever disciplinary measures. But at the bottom of it, there has to be consequences. The worst thing that can happen to you is that somebody stole, others in the organization know about it, and then that person walks scot free. What you have just said is that, what you have just done is that you have in, in, increased the incentive part of the fraud triangle, which is that if I take the risk and I steal, the worst thing that will happen is that they will just ask me to go silently. So, in, if, I, if I use examples of some of the things I'm seeing out there, yeah. one would be like to follow formal prosecution, that you, you, you get the police involved, yeah, you know, police stuff involved, like that. Yeah. The second one is the punishment proper. For any amount you steal, you must pay three times or five times that money back before we withdraw any case or whatever it is where we have against you. We can take your phone, go to your house, or, you know, all those things where we say, this is the rule, this is what you, this is the contract you, you, came, you, you, you got into. Yes. For everything you steal, you must pay back three times. And initially, I didn't understand that rule. And what I'm saying this is, we might have our own formal way of running businesses, but that there are these informal people, like you see in Lagos Island and all, they have their own traditional means of putting in controls that actually work, right? So when I asked, why are you charging three times what the person stole? They said that it's like cockroaches. The moment you see one cockroach in a house, what it tells you is that there are at least 10 other cockroaches. That's the law of the cockroach. If you see one cockroach, there are other cockroaches hiding under. So if you caught the employee stealing this one, it's unlikely that this is their first, first time, time, no so. matter what they told you. So that times three I'm charging is to make up for the other ones that, that I did stole. not see. And you go to some of these businesses and it's working for them. you know. Okay. So, But the bottom line is there has to be a consequence. If not, 
you are giving people a reason to do it. Oh, great, great. Yeah. Uh, I think this is where we're going to stop mm. and end the program today. <laughs> it's, it's been a bit, pleasure. Yes, it's been an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been speaking with uh, Mr. Paul Iwoha. is a business strategy specialist, a visionary in chief of uh, Small Starters Africa. He has worked with dozens of entrepreneurs across the African continent to start up and grow their businesses. John Paul is an alumnus of PwC. He is recognized by LinkedIn as a top voice on startups and entrepreneurship and has over 800,000 followers on the platform. His works, uh, his works and opinions have been featured on several uh, local and international media, including CNN and TRW and Business Day and Voice of the People. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. And for others who may want to learn more, yes. I'm active on Instagram at JP underscore Iwoha. Or you can Google me, John Paul Iwoha. I have a lot of material out there that you can get started on. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank so you. this is where we draw the curtain today on, uh, on the edition of uh, Business Around Town. My name is Mary Onaifia Debbie.